Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Improving ICS OT Visibility and Threat Detection with the Dragos Platform, sponsored by Dragos. My name is Jessica Gallis of SANS, and today's featured speakers are Ben Miller, VP, Professional Service and RD, and John Lavender, CTO and co-founder at Dragos, who will be moderating today's webcast. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the control panel at any time. Please note that a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be made available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to turn the webcast over to John. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Um, myself and Ben are going to walk through, let me transition here. Uh, myself and Ben are going to walk through uh, a, a demo. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about a scenario based around a fictitious town called Cyberville. Um, we're also going to kind of dive into what the current and recent landscape looks like in ICS, uh, touch base on the end of year report that Dragos put out last year, as well as SANS. Um, and then talk a bit about what ICS visibility or uh, what ICS asset visibility and threat detection, some different strategies around that and kind of provide a, 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 a demo or look into the Dragos platform as we talk through that. And, at the, and then at the end, if we have some time, we'll do some questions and answers as well. So if you, uh, if you have questions that come up during this, feel free to drop them in the Q&A section um, for Zoom. Uh, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders at Dragos. Um, I've got, uh, got kind of a broad experience across a bunch of different areas. So I spent about a decade at the National Security Agency um, working in strategy, uh, doing various, uh, various cybersecurity operations, uh, doing research and development as well. And I have a background in doing analysis. Um, at Dragos, I've been heavily involved on in the engineering and product side of the house. Um, and uh, let's see, with that, I will turn it over to Ben. Awesome. Thanks, John. Hey, everyone. Uh, good to, good to uh, see everyone virtually, uh, at least. I recognize some of the names on, in, the, in the attendees list. Uh, it's good to good be kind of out there, even if we can't attend conferences. Uh, my name is Ben Miller. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Professional Services in the R&D. Uh, my background in general ha has been in the electric space. Uh, so I, I was an asset owner uh, for, for a number of years. And then uh, after that, I moved over to NERC, uh, uh, worked with the electricity ISAC for, for, uh, for uh, five or six years uh, before moving over at Dragos. So I've been at Dragos uh, since the early days. Uh, and uh, the, the team that I have and, and some of the background on, on like what I'll be speaking to and, and how it's relevant here uh is on both the services as well as the r d side so services and what that means uh for me is largely our flyaway teams of, of responding to intrusions that we have uh out there in in the community as well as a wide range of other other services whether it's uh, penetration testing or doing vulnerability assessments or doing tabletop exercises or being part of the neighborhood watch uh, uh, uh program that that we we recently set up all of that is considered services uh, and is uh, some of the uh, what I'll be speaking to momentarily. Uh, but also on the R&D side, uh, what that speaks to is as we go through the presentation, you'll, you'll see a lot, uh, a lot of uh, content that, that is put into what we call knowledge packs uh, and we'll dive into that a little bit. But the R&D team is largely feeding into the, those, R, uh, the, those content packs in the form of being, being able to better characterize customer environments, being able to do uh, 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 analytics around threat behaviors that, that we'll get into as well. That's all uh, uh, being delivered uh, from, from the R&D team. Uh, so next next slide, John. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you can go to the next one as well. Uh, the We wanted to talk a little bit about just uh, what my team's uh, been seeing in the, in the out there in the world. A, a lot of the anecdotes that we have or or metrics that, that we've been able to establish are in year and review reports. So if you're not familiar with the, the ICS uh, year and review reports, they are a series of documents that we release uh, and publish. I think we did it in February of this year, 
Uh, we, we've been going on three years now. Uh, so this is uh, certainly a, a annual thing that we do. Uh, and we each year we release several of them. Uh, this year, this last year, we released three. Uh, some of that's coming from our intelligence side. Uh, so we have a, a year in review that's focused entirely on activity groups that we're seeing out in the wild, threat actors that are e uh, either have capabilities or, or, or intent around industrial control systems. Uh, we also have a, a, a awesome vulnerability assessment that we do. So, uh, so uh, part of our intelligence feed uh, in, in service offering is understanding uh, uh, new vulnerabilities, uh, uh, how, how they may be applicable to uh, customer environments and what the real impact is. Uh, and so a consolidation of those findings uh, is in that report. The report I'll be speaking to today is, I believe it's titled uh, First Lines, uh, our front lines of uh, ICS security. Uh, so this is essentially what my team has been seeing out there in the wild over the, uh, over the course of the year. Uh, you can see some stats there. Uh, the, as a, I was I was reviewing it earlier uh, this morning, it, I would say how this applies to uh, what we were speaking to today uh, in, in some of the challenges of, of just customer environments is uh, visibility into the environment. Uh, and, and that's that's in the context of if you're responding to an incident uh, that uh, largely that's already occurred. Uh, so you, you need to have already started collecting information in order to do that forensics, in order to do that root cause analysis. Uh, and that's a large missing piece. So one of the numbers that's not on the slide, but I have in front of me, uh, is 0% uh, of the IR cases we worked on last year had aggregated logging or passive, uh, uh, passive uh, visibility into the ICS networks. Uh, what that means is largely that all of our incident response was manual. Uh, so forensics is really challenging. It's, it's always slower than you think it is. Uh, and that's doubly so when, when you have to manually collect each piece of uh, evidence from uh, individual hosts in order to start telling that picture. Uh, but worse, if you weren't already collecting that information, uh, then it's going to be a challenge to even put that, uh, to, to identify what has already occurred. Uh, so you, it puts you in a very, not even in a reactive spot, in, in a spot that becomes challenging in order to understand root cause, uh, root cause and be able to piece together that story. Uh, largely the forensics, and doing the investigation is telling the story of what occurred and, and, and doing it uh, in a cohesive fashion. If you have large blocks of time, if you have logs that stopped, cap, uh, that rolled over and, and are no longer uh, covering the, that length of time that you need, then you have a gap in your story. And, and that's, that's not a good thing at the end of the day. I, I saw a question uh, uh, pop up as I was talking on uh, where some of these stats are. The year in review report, all three years actually, are available on dragos.com under resources. Uh, uh, so you can uh, pull up that report as well as the, the Intel uh, uh, activity group and, and uh, vulnerability report all, all, all from that page. Uh, one of the, the recommendations that we, we uh, have continually had uh, uh, is uh, ICS network visibility and asset identification management uh, and uh, you'll see reference to a couple of different areas. So certainly we're going to be uh, talking about the Dragos platform. Uh, and, and that's a, a codification of everything that we do. We're really uh, proud of our technology. Every customer is on a different uh, leg in their journey. Uh, and so this isn't a, a silver bullet. It's not going to solve all of your needs. The, white, the, the year, in review, uh, year in review report notes two different other white papers. They're in the footnotes of the year in review. One of them is a collection management framework. Uh, so that's essentially how you can uh, do the, um, do understand your visibility in the environment and, and piece together a forensic story without, uh, with or without technology, uh, wh whether it's mainly collection, uh, uh, collection of host logs uh, and, and basically creating that management framework of knowing what you have available in your environment and what the data retention is there so that you can uh, basically act on the data when needed, well, whether it is running through a, a intelligence report and, and doing a, a sweep of behaviors within your environment manually, uh, or being able to rely on aggregated logs and knowing that you have six months of logs from all your Windows hosts. 
uh, the collection management framework, which is again, also something that's available on dragos.com for free. It's out there. Uh, the other one is our crown jewels analysis uh, of framework, uh, which the, it's a it's a long name actually uh, on the white paper itself. It's something along the lines of, oh, there it is. Improving OT defense and response with consequence driven ICS cybersecurity scoping. Uh, ultimately what it means uh, uh, is it, it, uh, it posits the methodology that we use at customer environments on how, what is critical within a customer environment and what should be prioritized from a architectural standpoint, from a defensive standpoint. That white paper uh, combined with the collection management framework gives you the, the, the pieces in order to create you know, uh, programs agnostic of technology, uh, whether you're using the Dragos platform or you're just starting at the very beginning uh, and understanding what is critical in your environment, those two and what your visibility is onto those components those two pieces by themselves will, will go a long way to then allow you to start asking uh, more questions. Uh, next slide, John. Yeah. yeah, Ben, I think it's important to highlight there as well that part of that program while you're talking about doing crown jewel analysis and, and, and figuring out what is important, but also looking at and kind of basing your program around risk and, and understanding risk within the environment where the potential large impacts could be if there was an event or, or, or something to take place and how that would affect operations. Um, those are some very key points that we'll highlight a little bit in the demo as well, um, a little bit later on. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, the, this slide uh, presents some information outside of Dragos. Uh, certainly uh, a San, SANS webinar makes sense to cover some of, of what SANS is tracking as well. Uh, the, uh, these, this report and, and this survey is done annually at the, the SANS ICS Summit. So the SANS ICS Summit, if you haven't been there, is a annual event uh, hosted in Orlando, the very beginning of each year. Uh, so January, uh, genu generally February or March, I wanna say, uh, is when the event occurs. Uh, but that's where these stats are coming from. So uh, each year, the, there are polls that go out to all the attendees, uh, and, and these are some of the responses. Uh, now, certainly there, there's a bit of a, a bias uh, uh, towards these stats uh, in that in regards to these are attendees that uh, are attending ICS Summit. So they have a certain level of uh, understanding uh, and dedicating resources and the fact of uh, uh, people's time and travel costs to, to get folks out to SANS. So it, it's a fair assumption as you can say this is some of the the more forward-leaning uh, uh, community members out there that are attending these these summits, and these are some some of the results, uh, which is uh, good validation uh, on, on what Dragos has been doing as far as uh, vis uh, uh, keywords of visibility and, and getting monitoring out there and and having some sort of asset identification program. Uh, this this is this is where we are as a community uh, uh, within the industrial control system space. Uh, and these are some of the challenges that uh, Dragos has been working on for, for the last uh, three or four years. Uh, uh, next slide, John, and I think uh, you take it from here. Oh, you're muted. Probably help if I, help if I unmute myself here. Cool, thanks, Ben. Um, let's jump in and talk a bit about the scenario and some of the context and background to it. Um, so today we're gonna be looking at a um, going to be looking at a town called Cyberville. Again, this is fictitious. Um, at Dragos, we've got several ICS ranges uh, running all sorts of different types of equipment and covering different verticals. Um, so we've got equipment, I believe in this scenario, running from Rockwell, SEL, Emerson, Schneider, GE, and a few others, I believe as well. Um, some of you might have ranges or multiple ranges set up, set up in your environment or at your company. Uh, some of you may not. Uh, ranges are extremely valuable tools to use, uh, especially when doing research, testing, uh, doing education as, as part of our five-day training class, um, as well as at SANS. I know there is uh, several different types of, of small-scale ranges to get hands-on to really understand assets, understand protocols, understand how they work together. Um, so that's a very, very important part um, of a program, especially if you're doing security and, 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 and want to understand and test things out before implementing things in the production environments. Uh, for Cyberville in this demo specifically, um, we're going to be looking at an electric range. 
that simulates power storage um, and also has a substation. The image you guys are looking at right now, uh, we've got the little icons spread out across here to look at um, up in the upper left-hand corner, we've got the site office uh, and then moving to the, um, moving from the upper left to the right, uh, we've got a battery storage network, uh, solar, wind, uh, gas turbine, a combined cycle. Um, and then down in the lower left-hand corner is a, uh, a, 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 a substation. Um, so that's what's comprising of this particular microgrid. Uh, so um, the purpose of the facility, just to give some background, uh, does have energy storage. Um, it's also considered a peaker facility. So in peak demand uh, times, the, the facility can kick on, start generating power um, that can help support the, the Cyberville town. Um, as well as it can support black starts or a, a black start. So there's a 240 kV transmission substation, 10 megawatt battery storage, and a 44 megawatt combined cycle uh, gas turbine running here. Uh, so the, um, let's see, um, it, it, in, in the event of a blackout, this particular center can help support the town. Um, let's see, the, uh, yeah, I think it covered the basics here. So we're gonna move on and talk a little bit about the actual network um, behind these different ranges. Uh, specifically in this scenario, we're gonna focus on the battery network, which is this dot uh, 10 range. There's also the balance of plants, which is the gas, uh, the combined cycle gas turbine. Um, that's gonna be the dot 20. Uh, we've included the dot 30, the, the, the substation, although that's mainly just to highlight that it's, it, it's, a, it's an isolated network and there's no traffic behind it, but we'll look at that as we kind of, as we dive into the actual, um, into the actual demo and, and, and take a look at how this, um, how this facility is, is architected and set up and, and, and what getting asset visibility really looks like from a, from a product specifically through the, uh, through the Dragos platform. So we're gonna start by focusing on asset visibility. Uh, a lot of common questions that we hear uh, when talking to the community or talking to prospects, um, folks wanna know what's on their network. Um, some people have, uh, some people already have solutions. Some people already have processes in place to go about determining what's in their environment, but a, a lot of folks don't. Um, so really getting a holistic view of what's in your environment, what assets do you have, how those assets are networked together, how they communicate, what protocols, and effectively just looking at operations a, 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 um, across an entire facility. Um, other questions we run into are, do I have miscon uh, misconfigurations or security gaps in the environment? Um, it's really common to run into this scenario, especially when you believe you've got your ICS segmented off from different parts, whether it's the corporate part of your network or just other parts that you don't believe that it's connected to. Um, a lot of times after we deploy a platform um, or, or have Ben's team go on site and do a security assessment and, 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 and really assess what's going on in the environment, we run in and find rogue devices that are plugged in. Um, those devices sometimes actually have external connectivity. Um, we also run into having remote connectivity already set up in an environment. Um, a lot of times that doesn't necessarily mean that it's malicious or bad. A lot of times it's intended. Uh, in, in specifically around cases where you have integrators or OEMs that need remote access into a facility to help manage and support it. Um, and then also understanding um, what changes take place in the environment. And it, it's very important to highlight the word when in that case. Um, for us and the technology and, and, and how we believe asset visibility um, is very important has to do with time. Um, so not just having a static view of what's in your environment at a given point in time or at, at, at the current time you're looking at, but really being able to go back and look and see what did this asset look like a day ago, an hour ago, a week ago, or a month ago, and, and how can I relate that to different detections or notifications that are firing in the environment. So time is a very important aspect, and, and we'll highlight that here in a bit, um, as well as what's happening inside of control protocols. So. Um, it is very important in the, in, in the solution you have or the solution you're looking for to make sure that that solution does provide some deep packet inspection. It can, it can look out, uh, it can look at, pick out application layer protocol information um, and provide that extra context to the assets that you have in your environment. Uh, we're going to kind of talk a bit about this and I'm going to 
step into the next slide here and we're going to shift over and take a look at what this means in the Dragos platform, but specifically for the Cyberville, um, the Cyberville network. Ben, anything you want to add before I step over? Uh, no, man, I think you did great. Cool. All right. So um, right now we are looking at Cyberville. Um, again, the highlights, we've got various parts of the network that we have zoned out. So within the Dragos platform, um, one of the very important parts for us is being able to do zoning, but being able to do zoning across an entire deployment, not just within an isolated area of a network. So for us, we deploy network sensors all over, um, whether it's in one plant, multiple plants, um, various tap points throughout the environment. And then from there, we can go ahead and zone based off of uh, whether it's um, uh, IP space, types of assets, um, uh, the uh, types of vendors that you have. Uh, there's a very rich way to go about doing zoning. In this particular case though, we've got them zoned out based on the actual plants, um, as well as I wanna highlight down here, this historian zone. So we talked a little bit about crown jewel analysis um, and, and, and having a risk-based program where if you can identify assets within your environment that could potentially have big impact, um, if they were to be compromised or if, um, uh, if an attacker was to gain control or even if there was just to be misconfigurations and things were to go offline, being able to isolate those assets and highlight them is extremely important. So for us in this case, we've, um, we've zoned everything out based on, uh, based on the actual plants and the networks, but we've also highlighted this historian zone down here, which is a main historian. When I click on it, you're going to see that... <laughs> This one particular historian has connections into uh, a lot of other places within the network um, at this energy facility. Oops, sorry, as I zoom out here. Um, so I know that this is a very important asset to me. If this was to get compromised, there's potential ways that uh, an actor could pivot all throughout the environment. So that's important to know. Um, another thing to highlight over on the left-hand side um, is if you do have external communications or you do have communications within your environment that's reaching out to the internet, um, in this case, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's communications you know about. So if you have an external vendor like an OEM or an integrator that performs operations or updates or, or, or does maintenance in your environment, um, being able to highlight those, um, being able to highlight those and, and zone those into one place to keep track of them over time is important. Um, especially from this view, I can get a very quick overview of what within my network is actually reaching out here. Um, and likewise, we have this internet zone set up, which is kind of a catch-all for any kind of traffic that's hitting IP addresses or endpoints that, uh, that are not considered within my network. I'm able to visualize those and have a quick cue into, if I click on this zone here, um, I can have a quick visual cue of, is there anything within my network talking to these um, talking to these endpoints? And then if I needed to, I could zoom in. I've already gone through and labeled some of these um, just to help tell the story a little bit better. Uh, but in this case, I can I get a little bit more information about them, the country of origin. So we've geolocated these IP addresses uh, because they are publicly routable. Uh, we've got some information about the protocols. Um, that were that were being spoken uh, between these two assets. So I, I can dive in just from this visual view and, and, and take a look at what's going on. Um, and then likewise, um, it's also important to be able to get different perspectives um, and different views of assets, not just by zoning like we're showing here, but um, being able to catalog and kind of characterize what's in your environment. Um, so up in the upper right-hand corner, we have the ability to come through here and group, group assets by a bunch of different ways. So in this case, I wanna see what different types of assets do I have in my environment, not just how they're zoned. Um, but I've got a nice easy way to, to drill down here and say, I've got what looks like about 10 different PLCs in my environment. Um, I've got some VMs, some enterprise management servers down here, some Windows servers, some controllers. So again, it's a, a quick, easy way to kind of dive in. Um, if, if I'm very new to doing asset inventory and asset visibility, um, being able to use a tool like this or other tools to help visualize what's in your environment to start asking questions and maybe start building that risk profile of what assets in my environment look like. They're either very important, what assets don't I know about? 
are there rogue are there rogue assets that stick out um, that would take me a very long time to just sift through logs to be able to figure out. In this case, you can do it visually. Uh, but then also having a different perspective or a different view where we're not so much exploring and, and discovering what's there, but in this case, having more of a statically defined view of the network and how things are laid out. Um, you can start to utilize capabilities like timeline analysis. Um, so in this case, I'm going to, there's my alarms go off here. Um, in this case, I'm going to use the timeline down at the bottom here, zoom back to 10 o'clock. Uh, zoom back to 10 o'clock and then walk through and get a view of, well, I'll just click play, uh, and, and get a view of what's happening in the environment, what assets are communicating, and how that communication changes over time. So if you've got a, uh, if you have a solution or if you're using the Dragos platform, being able to get a good sense of what operations typically look like over time and build that picture out. Um, again, you've got another visual way that you can dive in and understand what's happening in the environment here. This is very helpful to point out um, in the case of having a rogue asset or a rogue device show up in the environment. Um, I'm going to zoom into the combined cycle network up here. Um, and we're going to notice this laptop sitting down here, which um, is, is, is something new and is something that was brought into this demo scenario where we had a contractor come on site, um, plug into the network and start interfacing with this GE simplicity turbine, um, the G simplicity HMI. So if I wanted to get a view of, of at, at what point in time was this asset communicating and then what was this asset communicating, I can start to drill in and kind of move through the timeline to get a point of, okay, it looks like it came online around 1230, went offline between 1245, one o'clock, came back online around one, and then disappeared after that. Um, so in this case, again, it's a, 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 a quick way to kind of drill down and have a visual view and perspective as to what's going on. Um, if I want to dive into details to see more information about um, assets running in the environment, uh, you can do so by kind of highlighting them. But something I want to point out here, which is uh, we talk about deep packet inspection and the importance of protocol analysis and, and really understanding assets. Um, in this case, we have our, our, our PLC in the gas turbine network. Um, we start breaking out things like the SIP name or the, um, the actual IO card names, the vendor, the model, uh, the serial number of a device, just based on the protocols that we're seeing in the environment. And this is very important information to have, especially when you start getting into things like passive vulnerability analysis um, and just understanding contextually what's happening in the environment. Um, but looking for this in a solution or using this in the platform, um, you're able to get that information just by listening passively on the wire. So picking out protocols, dissecting those protocols. Um, in this case, we're looking at SIP. Um, we've got some information about the source and desk ports down here, as well as some additional context around how an asset gets characterized. So again, building the importance around understanding the types of assets you have, and starting to look at that risk profile and, and, and the different types of impacts that could happen if there was an event or if something was to take place against a specific asset. Uh, cool, so from there, we're actually gonna hop back over um, to, let me switch back over here. So, so that's talking about um, asset visibility, kind of an architecture overview of what's in the environment. Um, the, the second part of the demo, we're going to switch over and talk a bit more about threat detection. Um, so in this case, we're going to be using the same range, um, the same scenario setup. That's the combined cycle plant. Um, what we found is that most companies looking for asset visibility tools or products um, uh, to try to understand their network and what's happening within their environment. Um, after they get that visibility and really start building confidence into understanding what's in their network, um, from there, it's kind of jumping into the what's next. Like I, I, I now have a good grasp on my environment. Um, I have confidence that I can know if things are changing. Um, I can know when new assets come online or if things go offline. But now I want to understand threats and how to go about detecting those threats in my environment. Uh, we also commonly hear, how do I focus on the right things and not get lost in the noise? Um, so for products out there that are, that are, uh, um, either focused on or based around anomalies, where we generate tons and tons and tons of events. 
um, it's very easy to get lost in the noise. Um, so it's important to go about finding ways to drill down into the things that are important and that are relevant. Um, and then also having context available when detections uh, occur or when notifications are provided to the analysts um, to really be able to drill down and focus. Um, so uh, let's see, Ben, anything you want to add for um, anything you want to add for the detection piece here? Uh, the, the one thing that uh, stood out in the back of my head as, as you're walking through the, the, uh, the asset explorer uh, in, in the demo, uh, it, it reminded me of uh, a case that we did a while ago that was actually, it was, it was malware that had been uh, uh, within the, the environment uh, and measured in years. And it had beaconing activity. It was trying to get to the internet uh, and that, inter that traffic never made it to the internet. It was being dropped by the firewall. Regardless, it was on, on the individual uh, hosts. I, I forget the number of hosts that it was on. Uh, largely I, from from just, uh, John talked a lot about the asset uh, component piece, and but the, we really focus in a lot on zone to zone communications when we're using the technology. And it's something that we can't get when we're showing up uh, during a response. It, it, it's uh, uh, getting access to the, the, understanding the environment, the architecture, getting access to the right uh, switch uh, and, and configuring the span ports because they largely don't exist. And then you start getting insight into what's going on uh, on, the, on the, the communications aspects. Uh, that goes back to that, that point on doing manual collection. Uh, it's only from the, uh, starting now into the future uh, if they had that, uh, if they had something along these lines, they would have had uh, uh, months sorts of records of just activity that's occurring on the network, largely through zone to zone traffic that can start asking, even if it's not a, a behavior of beaconing activity, it's still uh, DNS uh, uh, requests that are odd uh, and get bubbled up into the platform in a meaningful way. Uh, so th that was, that was the, the anecdote I had while, while you were uh, talking through this. Thanks. So we're going to uh, we're going to walk through the second half of the scenario here. Um, talk a bit about detection, like we're uh, um, uh, and I I, I want to touch base on the four different types of detection. Um, so in in the case of the demo, you're going to see our 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 detection dashboard, which focuses on configuration, modeling, indicators, and threat behaviors. Um, so in, in, in the case of detections and kind of how things get characterized, it's, it's very easy to get overwhelmed by certain types of detections. So modeling configuration based events um, typically focus around either things that change based on statistical, um, statistical analysis or just um, types, of, uh, types of actual configurations or, or, or the way the environment is set up. So if you have a lot of um, uh, if you've if you kind of scoped out your environment, um, you have a lot of detections that that may end up firing around things like PLC starts and stops. Um, all of these types of events help give additional context and kind of serve as building blocks, um, as well as indicators. So uh, an indicator type of detection is what you would traditionally see with either it's an IP address that's known to be associated with um, a specific uh, um, a specific campaign or if it's um, file signatures or hashes, um, those types of things, again, end up becoming building blocks into what we focus at Dragos, which is threat behaviors. Um, and to talk through threat behaviors, we're actually gonna, um, we're gonna use the MITRE ATT&CK for ICS matrix. Um, this is a common lexicon on how you could talk about tactics and techniques across adversaries and adversary tradecraft. Um, it's also really useful when you're planning out scenarios um, especially the one we're going to go through today. We're going to highlight a couple different areas throughout the attack matrix. Um, these are things that our professional services team, BIN's team, um, has been using for things like red teaming, also doing incident response planning. So it, 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 it can serve a lot of different purposes. Uh, but in the case of this demo, we're going to look at a couple different areas. Um, so for the scenario, we took elements from behaviors of Alanite, uh, as well as Xenotime. Um, Alanite is an activity group that target, targets the electric utilities or has targeted electric utilities in the past. Um, and, and, and Xenotime is a group that's previously targeted petrochemical um, facilities. Uh, you may be familiar, familiar with the Trisys attack um, that happened. 
um, as well as we're going to look at a couple different events and kind of specifically highlight some of these um, as we walk through our demo here in a minute. To make this a little bit more tangible though, um, in the case we're going to go back to the range that we originally used, um, we're going to start by looking at the direct access from the, from the cellular modem um, on the outside of the network, look at some of the legitimate traffic that took place as well as some unknown traffic that we highlighted earlier out to that internet zone. Um, after that, an adversary kind of gains access to the modem, pivots down into the environment, does some fuzzing and discovery of what's in the battery network, then pivots to that historian that we talked about, that crown jewel kind of in our network that has a bunch of different access and is kind of considered as a pivot point or a central pivot point of the network. Uh, and then from there, they gained access into the GE Simplicity HMI and the engineering workstation over in the combined cycle plant. Uh, which ultimately led to issuing a first stop command of the PLC um, in that plant. So with that being said, I'm going to pivot back over here and we're going to switch sides. So a quick thing to highlight real fast, um, in our UI, we actually have this concept of a left and right side of the, of the drag bar here. Um, it's, it's, it's specifically meant to deal with use cases where you're trying to do multiple things at once, whether it's um, looking at a detection, and trying to gain more information about that detection um, or pivoting through and, and, and looking through cases and playbooks, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but I just like to highlight that because sometimes it can be, uh, it, it can stand out because it's a little different than a lot of UIs that you may be familiar with already. Um, in this case, we're looking at the detection dashboard, which highlights what we just talked about with the four different types of detections, kind of categorize the notifications that fire within the platform um, but groups them based on the type. Um, in this case, we're looking at this as a, a, as a summary view. So we have things that roll up um, into the actual detection that fired, not the individual events. Um, but in this case, looking over at threat behaviors, we've got a single port scan that fired, um, a sequential scan, an RDP or a couple RDP port mismatch events that took place. Whether all those events are the same, they're likely different, um, different occurrences, but also potentially different types of events broken down there. So that's one way we like help to offer break, um, to kind of drill down or kind of filter out some of the noise of tons of individual events that may take place. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to switch over to the individual view and just look at um, and just look at the notifications that fired. Specifically, I'm going to filter down or filter out some of the low level severities. So within the platform, we scale, or we have our severity scale based on zero to five. Um, typically our, our zeros are more of the silent, um, very uh, um, uh, event driven um, pieces or event, things that are event driven within the environment um, that are again, used as building blocks to build out larger contexts of, of composite events that are taking place. So we're gonna filter out the zeros through two, and we're just gonna look at some of the higher, um, higher severity events. Specifically, my eye kind of gets drilled down into this configuration quad, which is looking at the, a, a forced stop event that took place. So I'm able to filter down on that very quickly, as well as up here, we have an HMI discovery detection and a couple of strange RDP looking events that took place as well. Um, so from here, just by clicking on the event, we get some additional context. Um, we can drill in to see what assets were involved in that event. So instead of having to, um, instead of getting a notification or looking in a SIM um, and, 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 and getting details that way and then having to go kind of run down what, in, um, what assets were involved, whether it's the IP address or um, the host name of the asset, in this case, draw in that context immediately to hear the assets that were involved in this and by clicking on that, I can drill in to get additional details about it right on the spot or just go back to the notification and kind of move from here to start triaging what took place in the environment. Um, I, I, I did just mention SIMS and I, I think I saw a question about it um, as well that we can touch at the very end here, but um, it, it is a pretty common use case to see, uh, to see different solutions in this space where um, a, a, a lot of security operations already probably have a SIM um, as part of their toolkit. Um, and it's common practice to have notifications get generated and those notifications populate a SIM that helps kind of correlate data from all sorts of places throughout the environment, whether it's the OT side or the OT and the IT side. Um, so that's, that's definitely a very common use case and one that we see in some of our customers use today. But 
Um, it's also important to have that additional context for the events when they do take place. Um, so if we, uh, if, if we move over and look at this HMI discovery detected, I've got a related notification. So again, this is one of the building blocks that, that kind of fed into this behavior, where in this case, I've got uh, a scan that happened. And then after that, uh, an, an, an admin access event to an HMI. So kind of building that behavior of, uh, I had a device on my network, it scanned, um, it, it did some form of scan in this case, uh, uh, this case a, a, a sequential ARP scan um, of a particular IP block, which is that uh, combined cycle. And then immediately after that, that device accessed the admin interface for one of the HMIs. So I've got that additional context immediately with me here, but we can also drill down and you also get the other relevant context around this particular detection, uh, which is we've seen this detection before associated to Xenotime. It doesn't necessarily mean it is Xenotime. Um, it's more so that it's tradecrafted that that activity group has used in the past. So it helps provide a little bit more relevant context. Um, as well, again, kind of mapping this back to the MITRE attack for ICS framework, where we've got a couple different steps within the framework that apply to this particular detection or apply to the underlying events making up this detection. Um, and then down below, which, which we'll talk here in a second, um, one, one of our key value adds kind of from our platform and where the codification of our, uh, our expertise at Dragos kind of comes into play for Ben's team is being able to take those lessons learned um, and being able to kind of codify those in the form of playbooks to help instruct people that in the event of a detection takes place, how does your team or how should the analyst go about um, effectively taking next steps? Um, what kinds of actions can someone take after a detection happens and they see it in the platform? Or if you have it in a sim, what are the next kind of steps that you would do to go find out whether or prove out whether it's a false positive or discover if there's any other related information around it that would help provide context to either move forward in your triage or if you're doing an incident response, um, being able to tie that information together. So with that, um, we, if, if, if we wanted to here, we could create a case and kind of pivot over just for the, the sake of time. We already have one set up. Um, and specifically, this is looking at the scenario here for the loss of control or loss of visibility within the combined cycle plant. Um, we've got a couple of the notifications already attached here. So it's things that we saw that we think are relevant to this particular incident. Um, we've attached a few pieces of evidence, in this case, some, some, uh, some log snippets of the actual SIP communication that fired the four stop command. Uh, but more importantly, what I want to highlight is the, um, is, is, is the importance around having, having a playbook and kind of posturing your team or setting your team up for being able to operate in the event of something happening or being able to kind of take the next steps of, uh, let's say in this case, we have, a, uh, we have a playbook attached based on that four stop command um, that we saw. And then from here, we've got a whole bunch of additional relevant context to what the SIP protocol is why should you care about it? What other information can you go find, um, whether it's either in the platform or if you go back to that collection management framework that Ben was talking about, um, if, if you have various data points that you're already collecting in your environment, where could you go be able to discover that? And these kind of things are customizable. So you could come in here if you have, uh, if you have a different area that you are collecting logs and storing logs, being able to alter these and say, instead of pivoting over to the platform, go over to your SIM and, 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 um, and look for this type of data, um, which is possible here. Uh, so in this case, I was gonna highlight, um, as we step through this playbook, specifically kind of looking down into the actual protocol and some of the data that we're pulling out. Um, we have a concept within the platform called query focused data sets. Um, and that's our, that's our effort to go ahead and help help um, uh, help pull data together to help answer questions kind of it, it kind of speaks to the name there um, but it's it's effectively of all the data that we collect within the platform how can we go about putting those into data sets that will help easily answer questions um, so in this case I'm gonna expand this out so we can see both sides here um, it, it, in this case I'm looking through at the, um, at the various SIP identities that we're pulling out of SIP protocol traffic, um, specifically for this PLC, uh, and we're able to dive into, and here's where we're driving this, uh, here's where we're deriving the serial numbers, 
Um, some of the product codes, the SIP names, um, all related back to that device, whether it's the IO cards on that device or um, the, um, the, um, the, the chassis itself. All right, um, Ben, is there anything you wanna add on, um, add on to uh, this particular part around playbooks? Yeah, so uh, my team's both the, the, the users and authors of the, of the playbooks. Uh, so the, the Neighborhood Watch team uses the uh, playbooks and, and, as well as contributes to them. The, the response team contributes to them quite heavily. Really, the, uh, at the very early stages when we started in, uh, developing playbooks, it came down to, okay, so what problem are we trying to solve? Uh, and, and that led to lots of discussions. Uh, uh, but the, ultimately where we landed is uh, if there is a, a notification within the system, uh, uh, there's, there's that, that window of time where an analyst is trying to triage uh, what's occurred. What are the likely false positives? Uh, what is the, the point where there should be escalation? Uh, and, and what does what does this actually mean? If, uh, if it's a analyst that has uh, not a lot of understanding of, of what SIP is. They, they may not know what uh, SIP identities are and being able to describe and put that in context to the notification, th those are largely uh, what we're articulating w within those playbooks. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, which feeds into knowledge packs. <laughs> Perfect, thanks. Yeah, and to wrap some of this up, so we, um, as, as, as Ben was talking about knowledge packs, there are a couple different areas um, that we try to tie together the, the threat intelligence, the, the experience of our, our threat operations center, as well as our technology, which kind of comes together in the form of a knowledge pack. Um, these are things we put out, uh, we put out on a monthly basis. Um, there, you can import them into the platform, um, and it uh, effectively adds or continuously adds new protocols that we dissect. Um, different types of uh, different types of detections and analytics that get deployed. So as our Intel team continues to learn more about adversaries and activity groups, um, and 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 what they're doing in the world or in different environments, we're able to kind of codify those. And push those out to our customers. These are th these are important things. But if you're looking at this not just from a not just from a Draco's platform perspective, but being able to continually gain insights into what's happening, staying relevant into um, different types of behaviors, tactics, techniques that um, that that are being used in the real world, and applying those to your security program internally um, is, is 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 a very important concept here. And then to kind of tie all this together, um, just to kind of briefly look at some of the benefits of, of using the platform. Some of these kind of, uh, some of these can apply um, to, to things outside of the platform itself, but being able to have that, that expert insight um, be codified in technology to really help be a force multiplier um, in your environment, um, adding additional visibility, additional context around protocol information um, in, in operations and, and what's happening in the environment. Um, as, as well as as well as gleaning those insights from uh, from our threat operations team and our Intel team at Dragos. Uh, and with that, uh, we move to the uh, move to the end. I see there's quite a few questions over here. I'm gonna start looking through. Um, I haven't had a chance to dive into these uh, too much yet, Ben. If you've got one off the top of your head that you want to dive into, let's go ahead and start there. Uh, let's see here. So we've got uh, how many days can data be stored logging of traffic? Um, that, that's a great question. So with any um, with any solution in this space, obviously you're going to run into you're going to run into storage challenges, especially depending on the size of a deployment. Um, whether you have a uh, a collection strategy already set up and you're using various open source tools, or if you're using the Dragos platform. Uh, the the amount of data you can store is kind of based on the hardware and s some of the resource limitations there. Uh, for us, we have some very large customers that are storing data um, up to 90 days to, I think we've got some that are up to about six months or a little bit more. Um, so it's kind of dependent. Uh, most of the data that gets stored is usually contextual information around communications between assets um, as well as asset data themselves. So for us, our asset data doesn't roll off um, as quickly as other types of information, whether it's various logs that we collect 
Um, so that's a great question. Uh, let's see, is there an immediate alert generated that the laptop is connected to the network? Yeah, so in this case, we've got a, a, a couple different ways to, to go about seeing whether or not new devices uh, exist. Um, one of those things are uh, we, we have notifications that do fire um, as new communication happens in the environment, as new addresses come online or address associations may change within your environment, depending on whether you have a, um, a statically defined network or if you're using DHCP or something like that. Um, being able to track those and, and, and have those notifications that you can pivot off of, those, those typically fall into the configuration category. Um, so in that case of that laptop that we saw, um, th there were some new communication notifications that did fire. Um, uh, so yes, that's a, that's a good question there. Uh, let's see. Well, one of the first questions, uh, John, that was asked, I, I think we uh, have a good answer for that. But uh, to what extent are you seeing customers exporting the asset data uh, into other, other tools? Yeah, good question there. Um, so it's, it, it actually happens quite often. Um, so if, if you already have a CMDB in your environment or you've got a, um, a, a formal way or process that you're collecting asset information and, and wanting to store those, um, having that ability to export data out of the platform um, is, is, is definitely possible now. You can go in and export and, and, and create a full kind of asset report that's got all the different attributes that we, um, that we add to assets, whether it's the location of them or the type of asset or the SIP information that we showed here for that Rockwell PLC. Um, all that stuff can be exported and kind of loaded into a different tool. Uh, we've also got some integrations um, uh, currently set up and in, in that are being released um, kind of, uh, very, very soon. Um, one is with ServiceNow and their CMDB integration. The other one's with Splunk, being able to share asset data over to that SIM. Um, in that case, being able to feed notification information and asset data kind of helps you be able to do um, in, and draw value out of uh, this particular solution, but any other solution um, within a SIM. So that's a great question. Similar to, uh, you'll see the next one in the list, uh, similar, uh, similar in the example of the road device connection, are there customers integrating SIMs to manage events? Um, yeah, so we've, I'd say quite a, quite a bit of our customer base and uh, quite a bit of the community that we've talked to has a SIM, um, whether it is Splunk or Curator, those are two of the common ones we typically run into. Um, a lot of folks are, are aggregating data and events um, into their SIM. So it is pretty common that we see that. Um, and, and, and it is a good workflow. Uh, it certainly will help, especially if you have a, a large amount of notifications or alerts in your environment, and you wanna be able to start and triage that way and help draw some context um, outside of some of the data points that you may be collecting or seeing in the platform. Um, but where the value really adds or the value comes in is, is being able to pivot back into, in this case, the Dragos platform and get the additional context about the assets or any of the other communications surrounding that event um, and, 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 and being able to visualize it or in the case of having, a, uh, if, if you're using the case management system to do triaging, um, being able to start and do that triaging within the tool and sharing it with the rest of your team um, as you continue to work through that. And then potentially in the future, exporting that if you have a full-blown case management system. Um, the, the platform isn't, isn't meant to be a full-blown case management system. Um, our, our goal with that piece is to provide some of the foundation to do, uh, to do triage, um, to be able to do a response and aggregate data into one place and not have to pivot all over the place. But being able to take advantage of that and our APIs and export that information into a full-blown case management suite is totally possible. Uh, and we have had customers do that in the past. I have one question that I can answer for you as well. I, I know we have about six minutes left, so this uh, may be one more question after this, depending on how, how fast I can answer it. Uh, but one of the questions was, was regarding uh, span port traffic and, and just uh, driving the cost of having to tap, uh, have a span port on, on every switch and, and, and being able to deal deal with that that complexity, basically. Uh, the costs associated in, in a very large environment. Uh, th there's a couple options there. Uh, uh, so certainly, 
it, it's identifying the the where your your crown jewels are essentially. Uh, so I what we would recommend is getting uh, north to south traffic uh, between between the the zones uh, the trust levels and then areas uh, of heightened concern uh, uh, critical functions such as like turbine control for instance. That's where you would want to get the east west traffic uh, of knowing what's happening within within that that uh, net, uh, network itself. We also have additional uh, data that we can absorb that we didn't uh, fully touch on here, but if, if there are uh, host collection mechanisms or other data feeds that exist in your environment, you can forward those over into Dragos and we can ingest those. Uh, so it's not a, a only a question of uh, span port, uh, yes or no. Uh, there, there's a lot of other data feeds that we can ingest and, and do correlations on as well which uh, gives a, a, a lot of flexibility uh, for uh, folks in, in either early deployment or, or after the fact. Did you have... Uh, did yeah, you... I've got another question I want to... Um, another question that kind of plays off of that that I want to address, which is, are there any minimum requirements to be able to do this type or have this type of tool or in that case, kind of any, any tool within the environment that's monitoring network traffic? Um, and, and the question specifically is asking about managed switches within the network. So it's, it's not a requirement to have managed infrastructure um, to be able to do this type of work, but it makes it significantly easier um, if you do have the right infrastructure in place to be able to tap or, or listen or have span ports or mirrored ports um, on switches throughout your environment or at, at least within some key places um, whether it's some of the backbone or kind of what Ben just highlighted on being able to look at that east-west traffic versus having the north-south traffic when it's either um, in between your, um, uh, whether it's uh, egress um, out of your network entirely, but being able to look internal to the network um, is, is very, very important. And, and if, you don't have, uh, if you don't have managed infrastructure to be able to support that, you can do things like inline taps uh, which again, it's it's feasible, but it's it, it introduces a lot of complexities and challenges, especially when you're trying to get a complete picture as to what's going on in the environment. Um, so, um, it, I I hope that helps out. But outside of that, no, there's 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 not really a, a minimum requirement outside of having um, uh, uh, an Ethernet uh, an Ethernet network. So um, th there was a question early on about does the product work on on serial. Uh, serial links or serial communication, and our, our products is is IP based, um, so it it does sit and listen to network traffic uh, on an Ethernet network. Um, it, it does not uh, does not monitor the serial uh, serial communications, which is kind of a, a a different use case and scenario altogether. Uh, we've only got a minute left, so I'm not going to dive into that specifically here. But uh, that is a that is a great question that to ask, especially getting involved or starting to look at your security posture and what tools and solutions you have in your space. Um, understanding that this is, this is capable even if you don't have that managed infrastructure. All right, um, so we're at the top of the hour. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jessica. Great, thank you, John. That's all the time that we do have for today. Thank you to our speakers, John and Ben, for that great presentation, and to Dragos for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcast. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.